There's an episode of Seinfeld which completely flipped the show on its head, and I don't think anyone's even noticed. Season 5, episode 12, The Storm. Ooh. Oh, hey, how you doing? Hey, hey, hey. Uh, Jane, this is my neighbor Kramer. Oh, hey. Hello, Kramer. <laughs> In this video, I'm going to be diving into this episode, and the way it's ending flips the script on this classic sitcom. But first, I get to see the analytics data for my regular viewers, so I know that a lot of people who watch this video initially, at least, are generally below, say, 30. So here's a quick introduction to this program, which you've almost certainly heard of, but maybe haven't seen. Seinfeld was a sitcom which ran throughout most of the 90s, and it's often been called a show about nothing. In a move fairly unique for this era of television, this wasn't a big story an ongoing tale about something in particular. Hell, there was barely even a premise, it just follows Jerry Seinfeld and a few fictional friends as they live, work, date, and complain in a 1990s Manhattan setting. Seinfeld was also big, really big. Imagine Fortnite multiplied by the Avengers, and you're approaching the sort of cultural dominance Seinfeld held in the 90s, at least in the world of American television. This thing was such a juggernaut, and so successfully funny, that even in recent years, certain scenes and episodes are still being referenced and parodied in mainstream properties. We're going to Mars. Uh-huh. Have a good time. <laughs> So bear that in mind. This little history lesson isn't just time padding to fill a runtime. No, we'll come back to this immense cultural dominance in a little while. But for now, let's talk about the stall. This episode opens in the women's bathroom at a cinema, where two women, one of whom we immediately recognize to be beloved main cast member Elaine, are going about their business. The only thing is, there's no TP in her stall. So she asks the lady next door for some, but her toilet neighbor can't spare a square. Three squares? You can't spare three squares? No, I don't have a square to spare. I can't spare a square. <laughs> she can't spare a square! She's not a square sparer! I'm sorry, that was an awful impression. Moving on. After this debacle, both women return to the cinema, and we learn that the other is Jerry's new girlfriend, Jane, who tells Jerry what went down. The next day, though, he hears the same story from Elaine, and the penny drops. Elaine also mentions Jane's distinctive voice. Apparently it's such a unique, flinty tone that she'd recognize it anywhere. And she says if she ever does run into the bearer of this flinty voice, things are gonna get ugly. So for the rest of the episode, Jerry's trying to keep his good friend Elaine from meeting his girlfriend Jane, both of whom are eager to meet each other in increasingly silly ways. You know, your breath is a little garlicky. You better take some gum. Okay. Yeah, yeah, have a couple pieces. It's weak. Well, Week on, okay. yeah. Huh? Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you, finally. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you. <laughs> but while all of this silliness is going on, Jerry's uh, eccentric neighbor Kramer is also being a nuisance, using Jerry's phone to call phone sex lines, particularly one specific operator who calls herself Erica. She's, by all accounts, pretty wild. But after Kramer meets Jane, he starts to suspect that his favorite operator and Jerry's new girlfriend might be one and the same, because they share a distinctive type of voice. You think she's Erica, the phone sex woman? Jerry, that voice is tattooed on my brain. It's her. It's impossible. Is it? Or is it so possible that your head is spinning like a top? <laughs> When Jerry brings this matter up in the coffee shop, Jane's offended and storms off. There's also a B-plot where George is somewhat enamored of Elaine's new boyfriend, which I'm not particularly interested in for the purposes of this video, but it ends with George and Kramer accidentally disfiguring him during a rock climbing trip. Elaine then wrestles with the decision, should she break up with him in case he's no longer handsome underneath all those bandages? It's episodes like these, plots like these, where we can see the truth of a certain accusation which has been leveled against Seinfeld's main cast pretty often over the years. That they're all horrible people. Truly awful. Not always on purpose, not often in massive ways, but constantly just net negatives to society. Many of the show's most memorable moments are also examples of this malignancy. Like the time Jerry mugged an old lady for a loaf of bread. I want that ride, lady! Help! Someone help! Shut up, you old pig! Or the time George pushed past a bunch of kids in a burning building. Or when Kramer burnt down the cabin. Oh, look at the fire! <laughs> Holy cow, look at that! 
This idea that these four are all just the worst was such a popular one, even behind the scenes, that the show's finale doubles down on it, ending with the main cast sent to jail, after a cavalcade of damning character witnesses at a joint trial proves beyond a doubt their negative impact on the world. But the thing is, that finale was a big disappointment. People didn't like it one bit. And remember, this show was big. People gathered in Times Square to watch this finale. The result of this is a truly infamous conclusion, which to this day is still cited as one of the worst TV show finales of all time. Ironically, it was the show's runaway success which transformed a divisive finale into an enduringly negative cultural moment. But if our main cast are often awful people, which yeah, they are, why was this finale so poorly received? Why is it still sometimes held to taint the legacy of the show's preceding golden years? Well, I have an answer. Not the answer, not a definitive ironclad solution, but a possible explanation. And it came to me after re-watching The Stall, particularly the way it ends. You see, I cut my recap off a little early. After Jane storms off to the bathroom, Elaine recognizes her and gleefully follows, re-enacting their little movie theater disagreement with the roles reversed. Yeah, there's no toilet paper in here. I usually check, but would you mind? I can't, I don't have it. I don't have a square to spare. But here's the important part. Jane storms out, fed up, and, well, this happens. Don't call me anymore. You either. <laughs> This is a great ending. It ties up all the plot lines in a satisfying and hilarious way. But it's significant for another reason. It proves that the narrative about Jerry and his friends being awful people is wrong, or at least incomplete. They're human garbage, sure, but now we see that this isn't a blameless world. We see that sometimes the rest of the society these people are in can be just as false and cruel as they are. I'm obviously not saying Jane's wrong for being a phone sex worker, rather the fact that she outright lied to him while doing business with his next door neighbor. If nothing else, that's pretty underhanded. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this fundamentally changes the dynamic of the show. This moment changes Seinfeld. This isn't a show about four evil people causing mayhem in a fundamentally just world anymore. It's a show about flawed and capricious people in a flawed and capricious society. A couple of other moments here and there suggest a similar thing, like the way George's shrinkage is mischaracterized by Jerry's girlfriend eight episodes later, but we never see this idea suggested as clearly as in the ending to the stall. And this is why I think so many Seinfeld fans were disappointed by the ending. It's hard to buy into the moral high ground the finale tries to take when we know that these four really aren't especially malicious individuals relative to their world. I don't mind the ending myself, and moreover, I think it does fit in nicely with the reading I'm proposing here. A nonsense law arbitrarily sending four bystanders to jail kinda makes more sense when understood as indicative of an unfair, cruel world than as an instrument of moral equilibrium. But what I'm saying is, I think with the stall in mind, the mass disappointment with this ending maybe makes a little more sense. So that's how this episode flipped the script and changed Seinfeld in a way I haven't really seen suggested before. Please do let me know below what you thought of my argument though. Now, the YouTube algorithm is funny, so it isn't massively likely that this video finds its way to a great number of Seinfeld fans. What's more likely is that YouTube will look at the types of viewers who have watched some recently successful videos of mine, suggest this to them, and then stop promoting it immediately when they don't click on it. But if this does make it through the noise, if there is a response, then I'd love to talk more about this show, maybe even in a long form video essay, because I've got a pretty nifty idea. I've finally figured out what Seinfeld is about, and it isn't nothing. So if you want to hear me speak on that, then let me know below and drop a like. Otherwise, I'll thank my patrons and get out of your head. So big up everyone on screen now, and especially Kevin Douglas and Ian Fifield.